evening, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat here at the bike stop in Philadelphia. It's April 12th, going rather 2014. I'm Doug O'Keefe. I am the co-producer and the host of the fireside chats. These are produced with Mistress Joanne Gaddy and Christina Court, who is doing the filming of the chat. Now, to that vein, only we will be filmed. The audience will not be filmed, so you don't have to worry about being captured on, that, on camera. These chats are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum at which they will be housed. I have a few questions for my esteemed guest, my personal friend that I met in Cape Town, South Africa in 2009, Yaku Lawrence. Thank you. Okay. Big hand for Yako. Thank you. <laughs> Hold on one second. I got something out of order. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry about that. All right, let's start right at the beginning. Please tell us a bit about your family and the circumstances in which you grew up. I grew up in Newcastle, South Africa. I was born in Pretoria, which is right next to Johannesburg. And I was born in the heights of the struggle against apartheid, which meant obviously all races were separated. My upbringing was poor, but quite very, very loving. Um, very church going, so freedom. And since we, uh, this, this um, conference is Faces of Freedom, I didn't really have the freedom that I really wanted. So as a child, I was forced to, to obey rules and, well, guess what? You, you turn a little child that, that, when your mom says no, it means no, and she beats the living crap out of you, <laughs> which is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, but you, you grow up very marginalized in, in some form of some form of way. My family, I come, I am the the bastard of the family. Um, I have a stepbrother and a stepfather, and yeah, it's it's a. Um, I come from a family that you they demand respect, but yet you were put in your place very very quickly, and as. As I grew up, I realized what my identity was and how I became the man I am today. Well, for the benefit of the audience, would you depict for us the apartheid that you experienced growing up? Because I suspect that many people here are unfamiliar with that system. As I said, segregation was probably the word of the time. Um, other than our lovely maid who came to clean our house once a week, I haven't met any people, persons of color. It was a, as a child, you didn't know any better. You grew up and that was your, your lifestyle. Um, I met our gardener son called Tabu and I didn't see color as a child and I just saw someone to play with. So apartheid for me, was was a, was a horrible time. Um, I learned in technical college that people, there are other people out there. There are other than just black or white or Indian. There are mixed people of mixed race. And later later on, I found out that I'm of mixed race. I'm Afrikaans. I'm half Dutch. I'm half German. I'm half Italian. How much more of of a diversity can you get? So apartheid for me means a very repressive time. Um, I'm, I could never see South Africa going back to that. And for, for anyone in the world, I would hate to see people living under those conditions because information was held with, with the help from you. I found out who Nelson Mandela was through my, my preacher from church. And the first words out of his mouth was, were, this is going to cause shit. How can I look up to someone who is a preacher of your church and then he's explained to me who Nelson Mandela is, and, and he said he's a, he's a terrorist. He killed white people, so he's a bad man. So you learn to live under those conditions, and, and those I, I, you lived, you lived in a bubble. And we thought that bubble was perfect. And then 
after apartheid was abolished. Life became better. You've depicted yourself as a rebel. How so? Oh, that's a long story. <laughs> um, as I said, I, I've always had a problem with authority. That's why I could never be a bottom again, ever. <laughs> my family, my mother was the head of the, the matriarch of the family. She, what, what she said was law. And if you didn't obey to her law, she would beat the crap out of you, which I think in the long run turned me into the man with principles I am today. The rebel part came in when I was told not to associate with person over here because of his or her gender or because of his or her color. And I felt that I needed and I wanted the right to choose. Now, if you take someone's right away to choose, more, more than likely they will become a rebel and they will become obstinate. And that's, that's what I became in life. I feel it's important that most of the time I have my own way, which is, which is good, that's why I have boys and slaves, but the rebel part came when I need to stand up for my own rights. I need to stand up for other people's rights if they can't stand up. I believe in being the rebel, you get things done, you're not always the hero, you're more than likely the villain. And I'm happy to play the villain against Batman. <laughs> Well, when we were preparing for this chat, you told me that when you were growing up, you didn't like other boys, you liked their dads. Would you please explain that for the benefit of the audience? <laughs> well, um, I, I've always been attracted to all the men. I don't make an excuse for it. I've always said that everyone, we all have our choices. You make your choice, there's something with inside you that you like and you enjoy. I like all the guys, I don't like them for their money, I don't like them because what they can offer me, I like them because it's me, I can't go against the grain. It's some, some, we all find something beautiful in a person, we're all different. Each, 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 of, one of, each one of you are unique and you have unique fetishes and what you find attractive. Um, I realized that I like people, my friends' fathers or dads when I was in high school when I dated a dad and his son was in my class. So yes, I like daddies. <laughs> Please tell us about your introduction to kink and leather. Ooh. Ooh, now this is a good one. I was eight years old, and my uncle bought himself a new motorbike. I was I remember being on sitting on the on the carpet on the floor, and I heard this motorbike arrive, and I had to study or do some homework. And he walked in, and I saw this mess of a man who I thought was nice. I couldn't tell him what nice was. I just knew I liked him. Um, you're eight years old, you have no concept of sexuality. And he took his leather jacket and he dropped it down and the first initial experience I had was smell. I smelled the leather, I smelled the sweat. Still today, smells are very important to me. I tried to pick the jacket up and wear it and it was so heavy that I thought how amazing and how powerful is this man that he can wear a jacket so heavy and it smells so good. That's how my king started. That's how I started liking leather. And I looked at him with adoring eyes. How can this powerful bearded man be so, be so sexy? And as I said, the, the, the most important thing for me is smell. I love the smell of leather and I still do today. You said you even mentioned this in your speech last night, that you had no choice to remain HIV negative. Would you please explain why you had no choice? Why did you not have that choice? Sure. I must tell you, I just want to quickly jump back. Sure. When I became a title holder in South Africa, 
I had an interview, because I'm the first Mr. S.A. Nether, I had the first interview with the lady and she said to me, oh, you know, you, you are a someone that other people can look up to, just don't tell me you're HIV positive. Wow. And I looked at her and I said, well, guess what, honey, I am. And going back to how I say I didn't have the choice, when, the, before, just before, okay, South Africa is literally about 10 years behind the rest of the world. You have, they'll invent something and it'll filter through and get to South Africa. <laughs> By the time the AIDS crisis happened in San Francisco and in the States, we knew there was a gay disease. We didn't know what it was. I remember a friend of mine asked me, have you been for your gay test? And I went, honey, yeah, I know I'm gay. <laughs> Um, I didn't know there was a test for it. I thought the test was in the back room <laughs> a couple of years ago. The, the test was HIV, and I didn't know what it was called. Um, the education we had in school, the very little sexual, sexual education we had in school was focused on heterosexuality. I was told to use a condom as not to get a girl pregnant. That's not going to happen with me. I'm not into girls. I love girls but I'm not going to have sex with them. So it might be ignorance and stupidity on my side, but I went and had sex without a condom. And that's something I live with every, with every day of my life because I live with HIV. Then when, it, when the time came for me to have my HIV test, I really thought that the people who were supposed to be in charge and teach me, taught us about sexual uh, sex education and, and, and STD, STIs, they never really did their job because they didn't want to talk about people being queer, people being gay. It was just focused on heterosexuality. And therefore, condoms for me was, was a party trick. I would pull them up and, and chuck them at, at moving vehicles. You know, that, that was me as a kid. How was South Africa impacted by the AIDS crisis? It happened, all, it happened very quickly. Um, my partner, who is now 67, has been HIV positive for 28 years. Um, he, if he was here, he could tell you more. For me, as a person, as, as me living with HIV, it happened also quickly. Um, all of a sudden, there were people being infected with HIV AIDS, um, people dying. I unknowingly infected my partner. He, he passed away five years later. Um, it happened really quickly, and it happened, it, 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 I think, because we watch America as, as, a, as a nation. We look up to America for, as I said, technology and everything else, and also with health. I saw the impact that the AIDS crisis did, and I saw the discussions that HIV AIDS is not just a gay disease, it became a heterosexual, uh, uh, sorry, I'm being wrong. It became a disease across the board. So it wasn't just for gay people. And the impact very quickly happened when heterosexual um, people of color, especially in our Zulu community, they got infected with HIV. And for them, as, as a culture, homosexuality is a big no-no. So how can they get HIV AIDS if it's a gay disease? So it became very quickly that, hang on people, this is not just a gay disease, this is a disease across the community. And the government realized very quickly, we'd be losing our, our workforce, we're losing our parents. I personally started a, an HIV AIDS organization called Devanani AIDS Project because I realized our domestic lady, her husband died of AIDS. She has to care for other people, and we have AIDS orphans. So Africa had to react. The world came together with concerts, Bob Gelbo with concerts. And we made, and we still have a problem with HIV AIDS. People are still ignorant. Um, my, my husband is a Catholic, and I don't hold it against him. <laughs> They don't believe in condoms. So I have a problem with this. If people are dying on the streets, at least prevent this from happening. Use contraception. It's too late for me. 
Let's back up a, one step. You mentioned losing your first partner, Andre. Please tell us about that. You were young when that happened. How did that affect you? Uh, okay. Um, I met Andre and fell in love. You know, you meet your first love of your life and, huh? Excuse me. Where's the pen? Um, he, he was a very strong brute of a bear and I met him and unknowingly I infected him with HIV. And that's water under the bridge. We decided to go for an HIV test. And I knew before we went I was positive because of things that happened with me. How did it impact me? Um, mm. I grew up instantly. I was, I'm, my birthday is 9-11, which is a terrible time. My Andre died on 9-11. He died on my birthday. And instantly I grew up. I felt, because he was always the, the caregiver. He was always the one who said, I'm gonna pay the bills. You hand your money to me and I will. I was the boy in the relationship. And all of a sudden there is this big brute of a man who gets reduced to nothing. And he passes. All of a sudden life becomes very real. And that's why I am so passionate about caring for people, passing on that energy of care to other people. So I literally grew up within a couple of months where you see a man wasting away. Going in a slightly different direction at this point, you were the very first Mr. South African Leather. How did that contest come about? How did you come to be in that position? I heard of a um, recon. Most people are on recon. And my profile states I'm kinky, I'm into leather, this is who I am. And for South Africans, in the internet bec became a solace. Um, we don't, ha we, we didn't, and we still don't have the communities that you, that you guys have. So for us, internet is a blessing and a curse. So, <coughs> excuse me, I received a phone call from a, a, a guy called J Jamie Myra, who is an ex-American, he met a South African partner, and I got a phone call saying, hey, there's a contest in Johannesburg. I live in Cape Town, which is halfway across South Africa. And he said, I think you should enter. I said, Mr. Myra, thank you, but no thank you, goodbye. <laughs> that is my first reaction. And he called a week later and said, listen, um, I really, really want you to enter. And I said, well, you convinced me why I should enter. He said to me, you, were, you like leather, you like kink, I think you'll be a good candidate. And I said, Jamie, but then I didn't call Mr. Myra, I called him Jamie. Jamie, thank you, but I'm in Cape Town. There's this rivalry between Cape Town, Cape Townians and Johannes, people from Johannesburg. Cape Town is better, obviously. Um, so, <laughs> and I said, how can, if I become Mr. S.A. Leather, how can I be the head of or the front of a, an organization in Johannesburg, but it's national. Let me think about it. Click. <laughs> he called me back and by then I spoke to my husband, what, what does he think? And I respect his judgment. He said to me, I have thought about it. You will win the contest. I think you should enter. And I did. I went up to Johannesburg I now you have to you have to bear in mind that South Africa has never had a contest. I thought it was a beauty pageant. Well, it is, but we all know what I and I was about. And I researched the hell out of my keywords were leather contest, leather men, competitions, and lo and behold, I won the contest. We were nine people. I was chosen. I was given a sash, and I had absolutely no clue what to do with the sash. What do I do? I have no one to fall back onto. I subsequently then met you in Cape Town. And I remember on the Friday, I asked every single possible question 
as you can as you can imagine, I asked Doug. Doug, the gracious man himself, we shared many beers, and he told me exactly <coughs> what his version of being leather is. And I knew that there's a contest. I heard about the contest called IML. I wasn't even told at my contest that I would participate globally. That wasn't even mentioned. Wow. Until you mentioned it to me. So there goes Google again. Instead of leather contest, now it's IML. Now it is international competition. And I remember sitting with my husband because of the time difference. I knew IML was going to take place. And I said to Herman, my partner, I said, guess what, and Mr. Jeffrey Payne won IML this year. Wonderful, he looks hard, he looks good. I wonder if I will be able to speak to him. Not lying to you, three hours later, I get an email from Mr. Jeffrey Payne saying, congratulations on your title. Wow. I, I'm a South African. Who, who am I? Here is Mr. IML congratulating me for a title. So that's where my journey began. Tell us a little bit about how the South African leather scene is evolving. Ooh. If you would have asked me this question in December last year, I would have said very slowly. Um, before December 2013, we were just a gay or bi male organization. I have always believed that leather exceeds boundaries, race, gender, passages. And it took me three years, excuse me, it took me three years to open up and to change people's minds in the, in the Constitution. So before December, we were just standing still. We had two title holders, <coughs> excuse me, two title holders of which, and I'm very proud to say, of all three years we competed at IML, we've all reached top 10, which I feel is very good. Yes. As a young community, we've done our jobs. So, moving on from December, we've opened up our memberships. We now include ladies. We, we have transgender people in our community. It's a bit of a shock to the system. <laughs> hmm. South Africans, and I revert back to apartheid, are still, they live with blinkers on. They're still not accepting of anyone that is strange, that is different. They are afraid of what's the unknown. And I've managed now to, as a chairman of South Africa, as I live in South Africa, change people's perceptions of mind. And open up the community. So I think we are evolving. We are listening and we're watching what other countries do. I believe, and I've always said that South Africans are great copycats. We look and we listen and we do. And sometimes we improve. So we, we are doing better. We, we are getting the word out there that it's not just what's in your pants that makes a difference, it's what's in your heart that makes a difference. I, I forgot, where did you place an IML in your year? As um, David said to me, Jeffrey Penn's partner, he says, you have all the glory and none of the responsibility. <laughs> I placed four. <coughs> and to me, it was a, it was a shock. Um, my goal was to place top 20. Um, Herman, my partner, said to me, I know you'll win I, um, SA Leather competition. I can see it, I, he sees it. Then I went to him and I said, okay, I've won this competition, I'm preparing for IML, where do you see me place? And he said to me, you're not gonna win. How do you feel about that? I said, I'm okay. I'm gonna meet people from different backgrounds, another country, I get the chance to travel again. This is gonna be bigger than the both of us. And I remember standing in line, as we all do at IML, and my name was called to top 20. And I walked up and I remember clearly saying thank you to the hearing impaired audience. Stood there and I started crying because I just reached my goal. I didn't, I didn't care about where am I gonna place from here. I still had a speech to do, which uh, 
it's as if, if you've if you've been if you if you if you are a title holder, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We went backstage. Everyone was texting that they they made top twenty. We got to the time difference. I tested, texted a couple of people. I woke them up at four o'clock in the morning saying, I reached up to him. <laughs> they were not so happy. And one of my, uh, my IML brothers, Toby the Ford, came up to me and said to me, you have a look of complacency on you. You're not nervous. I go, I've reached my goal. I'm happy. And I delivered my speech. The next day, I, and then I didn't place. I knew I wasn't going to place, but the next day when you go and fetch your envelope and you've got your placing, your, your, your letter with placing, after the interviews, I placed second in the world. Wow. After the final contest, I was fourth. Yeah. It was a shock, and I don't think I could speak to someone for the next 20 minutes. I was in tears. Wow. I was really in tears. Tell us some of your biggest impressions about IML, and also here at Leather Leadership Conference, what are your thoughts about Philadelphia and the scene you're experiencing here? I have one word to say, and it's, it's, it's unity. Um, I'm dreading going back home because I, I, I don't find family like this back home. Here is people from all creeds, all sectors of the community working to move towards one single goal. Um, I very often tell people I would love to have a heart tattooed right there, not because of my own heart, because of what leather community represents. IML is, we were 52 contestants. I keep in touch with at least 90% of those people. Wow. I'm, I, this is my first time at LLC. Philadelphia has been unbelievable. Um, and I'll, the people from Chicago are going to kill me when they see this. <laughs> um, I thought Chicago was my favorite city. <laughs> and Philadelphia is, is quickly taking over. Um, I, um, I enjoy the unity, the friendship, whether it's for five seconds, whether it's for five years. It's something that you, you, you can't explain to someone. And the more you try to explain it, the more people just go, I don't get it. I wish I could take my community and bring them here for one weekend. Wow. And let them learn. I bet you we will have a different leather community back home. So all I can say to you is IML, LLC, the, and these are the two big events that I've been involved with, is one word, it's unity. Yes, there are bitching and in and, and all communities, there are people who don't agree with stuff, but eventually we all stand around the same fire singing the same song. Have you visited other communities outside of the US, for example, in Europe? Um, yes, I have. I've, I've, I've been to Europe, I've spoken at different clubs. Um, I've been told that I'm too American. Is there such thing? Um, because I associate with the leather for me as more American. We, America has IML. It's an institution. I go to Britain or I go to Germany and I find a whole different community. Now we don't, all don't have to be the same. It's our differences that make us unique and special. Um, but I will always come back to America. I would always like to know that, and I know I have a family. I have family, whether they are a phone call or an email away or a Skype message away. I know that I'm welcome and I'm, I'm accepted. Well, this is a special trip for you here in the States at this time because in two weeks you will be judging Insel. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, headache tablets, headache tablets, headache tablets. <laughs> I've been warned by several ladies that they have bottles of Jägermeister on, on tap, um, and I'm not complaining. Um, no, Emsel, I'm honored to be one of the judges for Emsel. I'm the first South African to judge international contests of such magnitude. When I was asked, I, I said yes. It took me less than 0 0.4 seconds. <laughs> um, it's going to be an amazing trip. I am taking, I'm, 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 not, I'm not just going judging. I'm learning because, as I told you, we've opened up our contest. Yes. 
Last night we break, we breached two thousand four hundred dollars. Wow! And that purely goes to send them the, our very first Miss SA letter to Enzo next year. Um, so I'm learning. I'm I'm gonna go to Enzo. Sharon has promised me her minion that she's gonna sit there and she's gonna explain to me exactly not just the judging but the preparing for, for Enzo. So I'm going there by judging and I'm honored and, and happy and elated, but I'm learning. To me it's gonna be a learning curve and I'm taking that back to South Africa. When are you having your contest in South Africa? We have we will have it during I forgot the exact date, and Brandy, you're gonna kill me. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's around December 5th. Oh, December 5th. We have a leather and lion store that Randy and Ma Master Mike has organized. Our judges, it'll be around the same time. Our judges will be, out of five judges, three will be international judges, which we are so honored to have. So we will have our fourth semester leather contest in our first missing other companies. So it'll be understandable. And by then, I wouldn't know enough to, to train our title holder, both male and female, for our contest. So it'll be understandable. What's the uh, interest in South Africa? Are you seeing a lot of women that are interested in being part of this? We, the people that I've, that I've been talking to, ladies that I've been speaking to, are very interested. Um, they know my, my history, the road that I've walked. Um, I know of hand about four ladies who are really interested. Um, I think, honestly, two of those ladies stand a very good chance of to make South Africa proud. They, they're eager to learn. Um, and I'm happy to say, most, a lot of people in South Africa think leather is a gay um, based organization. I strongly feel, and I'm not going to be a judge, I'm only the producer, that I feel that our lady will be a heterosexual lady who rides bigger motorbikes than most guys. <laughs> Let's take it to a slightly lighter note at the moment. <laughs> what are your favorite activities, your favorite kinks? Really? On camera? No. <laughs> On many cameras. On many cameras. <laughs> Let's see, uh, I like showers, you know those long showers, okay, showers, I love bondage, I, I started off as a boy, being, being, I thought that as a younger man, because I like daddies, I had to be the bottom, so I was tied up a lot, I was pissed on a lot, um, I wasn't too much for being the bottom sexually, um, and I'm, I would, I've always said to people, I'm not a size queen. If it, if it can fit in my mouth, it's good enough. <laughs> I, I do enjoy role play a lot. I think that's, my mind is my biggest sex organ. Um, yeah, and I think those, those are my favorites. I, I flag a couple colors, but I would say if I had to choose, and this is gonna shock many of you, it's romantic kissing with my husband. Mm, that's sweet. Here we go. Very sweet. <laughs> Who was Nelson Mandela to you? Now, I told you earlier that uh, I had a preacher who who helped who helped our family when I had some sexual problems with my sexuality, and he was asked to come and assist. And all he wanted to do was just to pray the gay away. So, and I said this in my, my keynote speech last night, his wife entered the room and asked us to switch on the television. And there's this presenter saying, um, Nelson Mandela would be released from prison soon. I had absolutely no clue who Nelson Mandela was. No clue whatsoever. The government kept this away from most people. Oh, well, I was a kid at the time. Kept it away from, from, from from the news. So I looked at him and I said, well, who is Nelson Mandela? And, and he gave me his description. For me, Nelson Mandela was and still is someone who teaches me that I shouldn't hate someone. 
We had a little discussion earlier about being a minority in a minority in a minority. How dare I discriminate against someone because of their color, because of their gender, because of their fetishes? I, for me, he represents complete humanity. There was a man who was in jail for 27 years, and guess what? They didn't change white people into the, into the sea as, what we, as people were led to believe. There's a man who said to his jailers, I forgive you. I'm sure we've all held grudges. I have to help grudges against people because they've done X, Y, or Z. <coughs> There's a man who said to his jailers, that's okay, I forgive you. I, and he led from example. I look at him and look at this, at Madiba, as we call him back home. Madiba is a man who set South Africa free. Basis of freedom. That's why I keep on stressing. He is my face of freedom. Because of that man, I have married my husband. Because of that man, I don't have to sit on this side of the street and it says, Europeans only. Because of that man, I can hug and kiss a person who is not from my, from my family. I remember meeting someone who we had a, a little fling in the bathroom, a public bathroom one day. And I, said, and I walked out, and he was of color, and I walked out and I thought, I'm, I can be arrested twice for what I've just done. And he joined me, he said to me, oh, are you still here? I said, yes. I said, do you realize we can get arrested for this? Not once, twice, because we, there was, we couldn't be homosexual, and I couldn't cross the, the color barrier. And this was so funny. And that was a good thing. So for me, Nelson Mandela gave me freedom. And I will be forever grateful. What's the biggest misconception about you? Hmm. This is a tough one. <laughs> um, I wish my husband was here today. <laughs> um, I, I, quite honestly, and, and I'll be very honest because he will see this eventually. I asked him the question. And he said, "No, no, you need to ask. The, you, you need to answer it yourself." And I honestly, I didn't know. But I'll tell you what he told me. Okay. People think I'm a fabulous cook. <laughs> People think I am the best cook possible. I can make the best curry, and you want to know why? When we have people around, I am the host, because I'm the head of my family. I stand there, I greet people as they come in, I am the host, I entertain everyone, but he does the cooking. And they say to me, oh, fabulous meal. Well, thank you. <laughs> and I'll go to my husband, I'll go, honey, I did great, didn't I? <laughs> so people think I'm a very good cook. It's not me. <laughs> I, I can do breakfast. I'm fabulous in bed. But I can't cook. So that's my biggest <laughs> If you could change anything at all about your leather journey or your current leather world, what would you change? Besides solving world hunger by Tuesday, um, what could I change? Tough question. Or would you change anything? I would always want to change things. I believe change is good. Change is something that scares people. Change is something that tests people and, and demand thinking. I would love to see change in the form of, let's be nice to one another for starters. Because, and, and this is not a world peace speech, uh, I'm not all for that. But seriously, uh, back home, and you people back home can see this on YouTube, I am seen as a villain because I make, I make certain choices, I make certain stands about certain things. And I do things for the greater of the community, not for me, not, not to benefit myself. I'm way past that. I've got what I want. I've got a wonderful family. I don't need to put someone down 
to make myself, to make me feel better. Yeah. So I'd like to start by saying to, to Mr. X or Mr. Mrs. X, stop bullshit, bullshitting each other. Enjoy each other's company and respect. There's a simple little words that one need, one, what we have. And we tend to stare at ourselves in mirrors and not thinking or not approaching, approaching the next person and saying, you know what, I understand your trouble. And I, I understand that you can accept me for who I am. And let's, let's talk to one another. Let's just engage more. World Peace by Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> How did you know to transition, or when did you feel the need to transition from boy to man, or sir, rather? I, as I told you, I started having an interest in men at a very early age, and I thought that it was just normal for a younger man who was interested, younger boy who was interested in an older man to be the bottom. So, along with my kink and my journey, you were expected to be the bottom. And I had a daddy in, when I grew up, I was around 24, who would tie me up and I would be dominated, but very inexperienced. South Africa, at, at the time, you relied on books, on, on limited, limited uh, VHS. It, um, so that, 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 that was our medium. There was, there was, those were the days before internet. So, and obviously what they would, people would pass on to him, pass on to me, and he would tie me up, and it would be, it would be a fun game to get out of the bondage. And then one day I realized, you know, I'm getting bored with this. So I said to him, what if, what if I get out of my bondage and I tie you up? And I got out of the bondage, and I tied him up. And then it became a role play, and, and it was fun, but then that became boring because I realized that the older I get, I didn't have to be a bottom for someone. It, it, for me, transitioning into, from a bottom boy into his top partner within six months. And I realized that I could dominate an older man, and that became a huge obsession with me. And it's still today. I get off on dominating someone taller, bigger, and older than me. It's, 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 it's a sense of power. And I guess with a lot of different playing, with a lot of different your kings, it's power exchange. Yeah. But when I became a so, the same daddy one day said to me, you should become a leather master. And I said, I have no clue how. And I did research. And he was the person, and I had a discussion with someone back home quite recently, is, oh, very nice leather hat you have. <laughs> and I went on to explain, this is not just a hat I'm wearing. I'm not wearing it, obviously, not tonight. But this is not just a leather hat. This is not just something I'm wearing to make, to make myself feel pretty. He, did, he told me what a cover is. What is the, the history? How do you earn it? And I felt I earned my cover. And my daddy presented it to me. Wonderful. And I was taught, and then obviously I was taught how to wear it, how to remove it, what the significance is. And with my travels, I live and learn all the time. And the most important thing that my cover means to me in becoming a sir is respect. I respect my slaves, I respect my boys, and I demand respect back. And, and also, the fact that I put a cover on my head, and I, and I walk down the street, or I walk into a dungeon, it doesn't give me a ticket to be an asshole. <laughs> that is respect. So, to answer your question, I, it took a long time for me to transition. Because I didn't understand SMM all that much. I didn't understand the leather, his, the leather history and culture. But it came in time. Mm. And there was one day when I looked at my, at my husband, who was my slave at the time, and I said to him, I think, finally, I can call myself a master. And he said, well, why do you say that? I said, because I can do everything in our bedroom behind a closed door and I can love you at the same time, and 
I'll respect you and I'll give you honor in that way. So by him accepting me with, as a sir and my, with my cover is my biggest validation. Fantastic. Very good. I have another, can I ask a question? Can Do you want this on camera off? or on please, camera? Please, please. On camera? Yeah, this is a leadership question. Okay. <laughs> I was curious as to what is it about your experience as a Lebanon from South Africa you could teach us here in the States as Good one. how, you know, as a, as a Lebanon or as a leather sir, daddy? Fantastic. At the discussion panel, international discussion panel, we had a similar question. And we had Nigel, who was British. We had Master Jack Pierce, who's Canadian. And two other, a lady and another man from Canadian. Their names their names are mine at the moment. Um, what can I teach you? Hmm. I, um, my answer to them was, I'm busy being taught. Because your history has, you have more history in your culture and, and in your own clubs and bars than, than I can ever imagine to be. If there's something that I can teach you is, hmm, be nice. Um, don't discriminate just because you think you, you God's gift to people. Because um, you're not. We're all special. We're all individual. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm a hugger. I'm a kisser. Um, give that energy. Share energy. I, I have kissed so many people this, this, this weekend. I've hugged so many people. Um, just be nice. We, we don't need... There, there's, some, there, there's enough trouble in the world. And, and, and I'm not going to solve world peace again by Tuesday. I've done that already. <laughs> well, that's about Wednesday. <laughs> okay, now by Wednesday. Yeah. Um, no, just be nice to people. Um, just <coughs> accept and accept yourself. I, I had to learn to accept myself a long time ago. And it took me quite a while mm. to accept myself. And if, if you can't <coughs> love yourself, then you can't share love to anyone else out there. So accept yourself and then be nice to people. More questions. Actually, we've got a couple over here. Do you want this on or off camera? I want this on camera. Okay. Yeah. 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 I don't want the microphone, actually. All right. All right. I can uh, shout it out. Okay. Yeah, you, may, you may want to repeat it, though, for the camera. So, yeah. so Your experience with a boot black in the United States. Hmm. What is your experience with boot blacking or shoe shining or Good the equivalent one. Yes. Good one. in South Africa? My experience with bootlegging and at the LLC and in and, 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 and America. Back home, people have no clue what bootleg is. They probably think it's a derogatory term. Mm. Um, mm. They have no concept. Leslie, I was very fortunate that Leslie gave me, and I'm going to admit this on camera. Okay. Leslie, besides working her ass off at IML, gave me my first proper bootleg session at, 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 in her class. Um, my experience, it is wonderful. I've learned so much in your class than I've, I've ever learned in my life, which I'm going to take forward. You're going to be in South Africa in June. Yeah. And it's special. I'm a massage therapist. I use hot stones to make people feel good. I use hot stones to heal people. These hands, I believe I'm a healer. That's why I touch people. I make contact with people. And Leslie did exactly. I sat there looking down at my boots, being <laughs> going through the process. Um, I'm not ashamed to say that I I was I was aroused. I was aroused by my work is done. Your work is done. <laughs> Sitting, and I'm being aroused by this wonderful person sharing her energy with my second skin. And she explained to us exactly what she's doing, how and why. And it was just incredible. I, I learned so much in that little time. And 
hey, we, as I said, we all grow, we all learn. So besides the obvious arousal, you made it magic on my boots. So what did I learn? <laughs> that I'm learning more and I need to know more. And as, as I said to you in, in the class, I, I had the stupid idea as an ignorant leather man that all boot blacks are bottoms. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> and, and I want to thank you for it. Because I've learned a lot. I love you. <laughs> Oh God! I, I'm gonna have to have a lottery to yeah. determine who gets what. Uh, uh, Something over here. Uh, Why yeah. don't we ask this? Mm. Yes, please. Oh, sorry. Hi, my name is David. And I'm deaf myself, and I was wondering about in South Africa if you've met any deaf South Africans Good. and who are interested in leather. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, we we don't have many hearing impaired audio, um, uh, people in our community. We, I don't know of any gay, deaf gay person who's into leather. I know people who are gay who would go to clubs, and I would find it amusing and wonderful that they would dance to the music better than I could. <laughs> Standing next to a speaker and have perfect rhythm, and then I go, why can't why can't I dance like that? <laughs> um, but in, in the leather community, unfortunately not. We have a very small community. It is really tiny. Um, I would be, I would be lying if, if I say I knew someone. I, I, I can't lie. Um, but I do know general gay people who, who, who are there and who I have had contact with. David is a Facebook friend of mine who is simply amazing. And the connection we have is, is and I can say that to you, that it's just incredible. Thank you. Mm. Hey, this gentleman's been working outside. If I could not knock down the camera to try to get over there. Some of the cameras do run a bit short, just so you guys know. Uh, last night you mentioned some of the struggles that uh, you faced in, uh, or uh, people faced with apartheid and anti homosexuality agenda. Uh, in Africa and in other places, and I was uh, wanted to ask you a question, uh, which is, um, you might hear this from other people saying, uh, why do the struggles that are separated by physically by continents um, and oceans, even ones philosophically by gender, uh, color, race, um, and all these other issues, why are all these separated um, uh, issues uh, linked, and what are the consequences of inaction? from a leadership perspective. Sure. Wow. A bit of humor, as my daddy said to me, that was a mouthful. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. um, the, the first thing is ignorance. Um, people are being kept separate because they, they were forced to at one point because of apartheid. You were, you were gay, but you didn't tell your neighbor. Your, your family member. So separation was a big thing. If we don't, if, 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 you, if, you, if you don't reach out to someone next to you and you tell them exactly who you are, that ignorance is gonna grow bigger and bigger and bigger. It's like a lie. If you start off with a little lie, that lie is gonna multiply and multiply and multiply. And who knows where we might end up with. Um, crossing borders, the internet surely has helped us cross many, many borders. And friendships and love and trust. It's just how it gets done, how we move forward from that. Um, again, Nelson Mandela, I, I can't hate someone because he's German and what happened with the Second World War, just because of the fact he's German. I can't hate someone because they did something to me a while ago. I was mugged. In, in South Africa, but I can't hate the mugger. It's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a circle of some, um, it's a question of circumstances. So I think openness and and, and, and conversation certainly helps. I hope it helps answer, answer your question. Mm -hmm. We've got time for about one or two more. Sure. What is the one 
thing that you would take from the United from your time in the United States to implement in South Africa? And what would be the one thing in South Africa that you would want to implement in the United States? Excellent question. Okay. The thing that, I, that I'm gonna that I'm going to implement to people in South Africa. What would you like to? Would that would like to? No, I'm going to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> is that there is a broader community out there. There are people who don't care that you are South African. Don't care that you like the color green. That we need to all reach out to that person and take that. I'm taking my experience and I share it on to the next person. Um, I've had some other members who've been to, who have been to America with the, um, with the Philadelphia Pride. And he has shared his view, not just my view. So it's a universal thing. People need to learn that. South Africans need to learn that this is what's happening in another country. This is the bonds and, 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 and family that it gets created. And share, share that on with other people. What would I bring up from South Africa to Cape Town? Sunshine? <laughs> we have glorious weather. Um, there's very little I can teach. I think I can teach people. I am, what you see is what you get. I think there are even more wonderful people than I can imagine to be, even in this room. There are people I look up to and there's nothing I can, I can teach you. And so I'll bring the weather and hope your, your winters are better. <laughs> Yes, I have one question. Um, you, you talked about the apartheid, and you talked about the freedom in South Africa that you continue to got. You especially have uh, uh, the rights to marry way before the United States did. Um, but sometimes we get complacent uh, here in the United States, and, and, uh, and in some countries get complacent. And uh, so if we could give you anything back to take to your country, for instance, some of the complacency has been just recently, within the last month, a young gay boy was burned to death on the streets of uh, Cape Town. Um, and um, we don't hear that so much in the United States. And so therefore, I'm thinking maybe we can give our support here in the United States and take, uh, give you certain things to take back. What would those be? that boy Tom. Um, yes, there, there was a man, a young man, 21 years old, in the prime of his life, a beautiful boy, who was literally set on fire because he's gay. And he lives less than an hour away from him. And this was just four days before I left for my trip. I mentioned it in my keynote. What, what, what can you guys bring for us is support. Um, know that we can reach out to, to all of you and say we are a, 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 a community in need. Um, my job as an, I've always been a little activist and I will just quickly say something. Nelson Holifafla Mandela, that is his full name. Holifafla means little troublemaker. <laughs> that is his middle name. Um, I have, I've always been called a troublemaker. And I believe in making trouble, I get the word out there. So my job as an activist, as the front man for South Africa, is my job is to tell people about these things. I was fortunate to, I am fortunate to be here today and share, share with you my story and, and what, what happens back home. If I didn't tell you about this 19 year old boy who, sorry, 21 year old boy who was burnt alive, you wouldn't know about this. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a two-way street. We all need to work together. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what community you're from or what country you're from. We all have needs. We all have problems. And half of the, half of, half of the states in America have banned same homosexual marriages, same-sex marriages. We all need to work together, and I believe there is a way. And, we, and it's possible. Okay, one more question, last one. Anybody? Okay. Last, last chair. Is it dead? Maybe. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, from you. Okay, so last year when Sir James came to visit, he when he went back home, he initiated a pen pal group for women in South Africa yes. with women in the United States. Is that something that you would be willing to initiate for additional trans men, leather men in South have, Africa? I have worked with, and uh, yes, definitely. I have been working with James on that. I share and value his, his knowledge and, and his passion and drive. He's the most passionate, driven man that I've known in, lo in a long time. Um, definitely. I, I do believe that I have my own ways in reaching out to people. Um, we all have different platforms. We all have different visions. James and I have sat together and we, we discussed this. And we have a clear view of where we want to go with this. Um, I said this to, to so many people this weekend. I wish I could take South Africa's community, place them for one weekend at one of these conferences. We will move mountains. Because people, have no, people back home have no clue how amazing this is. And how accepting, I'm as a South African sitting here today, how accepting and, and valued I feel being in your community. Thank you. Thank you.